the preformed or 18 plus fatty acids that this high protein co-product um, potentially were more easily incorporated into the milk fat, thus increasing some of our efficiency. host of the Dairy Black Belt podcast. My guest today is Addison Carroll. She's a PhD student at University of Nebraska-Lincoln, working on the direction of Dr. Paul Conanoff. Addison, welcome to the Dairy Black Belt. Thank you, Bill. Um, you're a PhD student. What are you going to do when you're done? Yeah, so I really enjoy the science side of things, so I'd like to stay in that vein. However, you know, whether that's industry or academia, I haven't quite pinpointed that yet. Well, as a former academician, I don't forget academia. So, okay, we're going to talk about a paper, a pretty complex paper on what you, you published recently in Journal Dairy Science on energy and nitrogen metabolism of a new, new corn byproduct uh, feed ingredient. We're going to emphasize energy today just because of time. So first of all, in this experiment, you used a co-product. Could you describe the, the co-product first? So this is a corn co-product from the ethanol industry. Now, this co-product differs from previously utilized high protein distillers grains um, kind of in the literature because this product is actually uh, fractionated. That protein fraction uh, occurs post-fermentation instead of pre-fermentation as we've previously observed. So that's that's the difference. And it's, it's pretty high in protein well, as well. It's not yes. like high protein distillers. It's what, 50%, 45 or 50% crude protein. Yep, 50%. Okay. And then in the experiment you did, what were the treatments basically? Yeah. So the treatments, it was an increasing inclusion experiment. So our first treatment was a control containing 8% soy pass and 0% of the high protein co product. Next, we had 2.6% of the co product and 5.4% of the soy pass. And then we switched to 5.4% of the co product and 2.6% of the soy pass. And then finally, we had 0% percent of the soy pass and eight percent of the high protein co-product so just a linear substitution of, of this product for soy pass and if i recall most of the, the nutrients ndf starch etc were essentially the same across all diets a little fluctuation but not very mm -hmm. much so th this is an energy study so first of all tell us what how do you measure energy yeah, so energy studies are, are really complex, right? So we can we can get the energy of a feed by blowing it up in a bomb calorimeter and getting the, the total combustion of this ingredient. However, when we start moving through energy balance, right, we have to start accounting for all of the pieces of where energy goes, right? So when we go from that total energy to a digestible energy, then we have to lose energy through the feces, right? So that means we have to totally collect the feces, get the, all, the whole amount, and then bomb a piece of it in order to get the energy associated with the feces. Then from digestible to metabolizable, we have energy that leaves through methane as well as the urine. And then finally going from the, our metabolizable energy to our net energy, we lose energy as heat. And so in order to estimate heat production here at Lincoln, we use head box style indirect calorimeter, calorimeters um, when we use an equation in order to get go from gas values to a heat production value. So all of these things are, are very complex and you have to be able to measure them with um, a degree of, of certainty, right? Because you're going down through this scheme and you're getting uh, some residual kind of error as you go and cumulative error. Right. And so in terms of energy, you know, normally it's about a third, a third, a third in terms of heat production, fecal energy losses and milk, uh, milk energy as a percent of gross energy. Uh, methane and urinary energy is less and then tissue kind of fluctuates. No wonder there's so little actual measured net energy values of diets is because it is so, so difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. It's essential information, but very, very hard to get. So with the this uh, product, what did you find with respect uh, to energy? Say, so, you know, let's just do net energy. What what, how, what did you find? Yeah. So what we observed uh, was a kind of a linear tendency for in increasing net energy of lactation with increasing inclusion of this high protein co product. Is that what you expected? Did you expect this to have? Because basically, you're saying this product has more energy than soy pass, more or less. 
Yeah. So going in, I definitely did not think I would observe that just based on some of the previous research in high protein distillers, which I mean, is a different product relative to this high protein co-product. But I, yeah, we definitely didn't think this was going to happen. Yeah. If, if I recall most of the, there wasn't a lot of difference in digestibility. There wasn't a lot of difference in urine or methane. Most of it was in the efficiency of ME to NEL. Do you have an explanation or hypothesis why this product increased that efficiency substantially? Yeah, we have two thoughts, right? So the first thought is that the preformed or 18 plus fatty acids that this high protein co-product um, potentially were more easily incorporated into the milk fat, thus increasing some of our efficiency. And then another factor we consider is our milk fat to milk protein ratio changed from the low uh, control value to the high uh, value. We had more milk fat uh we had a greater uh, milk fat to protein ratio in our high diet. And ultimately, protein creates a lot of heat yeah. and it's less efficient than producing milk fat itself. Yeah, quite, quite, quite a bit of heat. Adiseo, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smart Amine M, the best in-class rumen protected methionine product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production capture more value from their components, and maintain the lifetime performance of their herds. For more product information and to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids, go to milkpay.com. You know, the, the, if I recall, the energy difference, the intake was not different between treatments. So energy intake, though, was substantially higher. And it, it really, for all the, all the all the diets that had the product, it was higher for all of them. It was a linear thing, but they were all, all of them increased. It was a lot of milk, a couple kilos of energy worth of a couple kilos of, of milk. Mm -hmm. is, is this, again, is this product commercially available or is this a, a pilot study? This is, this product is now commercially available. Yes. And the other thing I always emphasize in when I did these type of studies is it's it's not the product, it's the substitution. You know, you might have got very different results if you would have substitute cottonseed meal or something else. So do you think this is extrapolable to just the feed or is there interactions here that you, that would make this a the substitution is the, the effect, not the not the actual feed? Oh, that's a confusing question, but yeah. So let me think about that for a second. Um, you know, I think potentially the the soy pass and the high protein co product have you know complementary things occurring within them, whether that's a digestibility factor or whether that's a amino acid factor, I'm not really quite sure. Um, but I think there is a complementary action occurring, at least in that medium or that mainly high protein co-product and lesser extent, the soy pass diet. Well, thanks for joining us and thanks for doing this experiment. Guys. Like I said, we have a, a very limited degree of actual measured net energy in the dairy industry. Thanks again. It's been an interesting talking to you. Awesome. Thank you.